<clears throat> the next part of our program is going to deal with uh, winning small claims court trial strategies and tactics. And uh, it's a delight for me to be able uh, to introduce to you Paul M. Iacono, QC, who will speak to this subject. I've known Paul for many years and can tell you that as a deputy judge in small claims court, he has an excellent reputation. Paul graduated from Osgoode Hall Law School in 1970 and was called to the Bar of Ontario in 1972. In July of 1990, he co-founded his own law firm, which is known as I. O'Connell Brown. He has practiced exclusively in insurance, tort, and personal injury law. He's been an instructor in civil procedure two in the Bar Admission Court. Of course, he's lectured for the Law Society of Upper Canada on various occasions. He has also lectured for the Canadian Bar Association and many other insurance-related organizations. He's a past director of the Advocate Society and is a member of numerous professional organizations. He has published many articles relating to tort law and other insurance-related matters. And as far as his topic, his talk this morning is concerned, as I say, delighted that he has served for several years now as a deputy judge of the Small Claims Court. And it's a pleasure to introduce Paul. Thank you very much. I can say without hesitation that as a law student, as a young lawyer, my days in the predecessor of this court, it was then called the Division Court, were the happiest days of my professional life. You must understand that in those days, we did what we had always dreamed of doing, examining, cross-examining witnesses, arguing before the court in front of good judges, like Judge Grossberg, and we had thin files, and we got our cases over with quickly. And it was great experience, it was great training. And being here today and discussing this topic with people such as Judge Grossberg, Rick Soderberg, June Cardwell, my mind is taken back to those days. But I think mostly of a lady who presided over that court who was much loved by the public and who ran that court with dignity, equanimity, and much good humor. Her Honor, Judge Edras Ferguson. She had a very colorful way of doing things. And one story that I would like to relate to you is this. In a case where I was battling with my good friend and opponent of many occasions, Jim Regan, where he was trying to mollify in cross-examination of a police officer some very bad evidence about the intoxication of his client, he said to the officer, did Mr. So-and-so tell you how much he had to drink? And the officer said, as a matter of fact, he did. He said he had one drink. And I remember he said it was a Bacardi cocktail. Well, in her reasons for judgment, her honor said, if Mr. So-and-so had one Bacardi cocktail, it must have been a foot deep. <laughs> In 1978, I got a call from Rick Soderberg asking me if I would like to be a deputy judge of the Small Claims Court. I've never regretted it. It gave me the unique opportunity to sit on the other side of the bench, to see what things were persuasive to a trier of fact. But I had the luxury, at the end of the day, that I could return to my own practice and incorporate that which I had learned. No matter what court you're in, the small claims court, the general division, the court of appeal, you're trying to do the same thing. You are trying to convince a trier of fact that your theory of the case is the right one based on a preponderance of credible evidence. The significant difference about the small claims court is you don't have all day to do it. Put yourself in the judge's shoes. He comes to court in the morning, he sees this list, he sees a packed courtroom, 
and he says to himself, how am I going to get through this list today? How am I going to satisfy all of these people that they've had a fair shake? That's his primary concern. As you've heard this morning, a judge in the small claims court, in the course of a year, will see far more citizens of this province than any judge in any high court in any province of Canada. And he feels a tremendous sense of obligation to the public. And that's why, and I go back to Judge Ferguson, she explained everything to the entire courtroom. They knew exactly what was going on at all times. You as counsel should approach the small claims court keeping in mind that you only have a limited amount of time in which to get the judge's attention. And you must get his attention. Your first opportunity to get his attention is in the pleadings. And believe me, every judge reads the pleadings. They should be simple, they should be straightforward. You identify the parties, you say what the dispute is about, and you indicate what the damages are. Let me just give an example. A makes a deal with B to build a garage at his home. So in the pleadings you identify A's the homeowner, B's the contractor, they made a deal to build a garage, and A says that B did it negligently, and here's how much it cost me to fix it. If you plead your case in that way, the judge will never forget those issues. And when you walk into court and your case is called, he will know this is the garage case. Be precise and be brief. Sometimes, after I've read the pleadings and a case is getting underway, I will say to the litigants, I've read the papers, this is the case about the garage, isn't it? Yes, uh, so-and-so says uh, B didn't build it properly. We'll hear A's version, then we'll hear B's version. And I find that that sometimes focuses the litigants' attention on the issues. Because so many cases in the small claims court revolve around findings of credibility, it's my view that in most cases an opening statement is not required. Uh, counsel who represents the plaintiff can simply say, this is the garage case, uh, I'd like to call my first witness. And the judge will be right in step with you. There are exceptions, of course, and you as counsel must decide that. In terms of preparing your witnesses, you should also be guided by the pleadings and you should spend some time with your witnesses. Go over the pleadings with them and say, now look witness, the issue in this case is the garage. This is what we're talking about. Forget about the damage that the contractor did to the front lawn, he's looked after that. That's window dressing. You must spend time with a witness. You must, uh, you must tell the witness what questions you're going to ask him. And most importantly, you have to prepare the witness for cross-examination. In most cases, this is your client's first attendance at court. They're going to be nervous. They're going to want to talk a lot. You've got to put a stop to that. Keep your examination in chief tight. Keep it confined to the issues. You don't have time for window dressing evidence as you would in a case in a higher court. Get some basic background information, get to the facts, and most importantly, have your exhibits ready so that at the appropriate time in the evidence, you can pull them out and say, Judge, here's the original contract, here's a copy for you. Be organized. Let the proceedings flow smoothly. A reference was made this morning 
to the unrepresented litigant. And <clears throat> this happens a lot in the small claims court because it's a court that's designed so that people can supposedly come without lawyers. Now, Judge Ferguson always used to say, if I had to go into the hospital for a heart operation, I'd want to go to a specialist. And she used to warn the people about the pitfalls of going to court without a lawyer and representing themselves. But in today's economy, with uh, a very high cost for lawyer services, uh, it's not possible in many cases. And a judge in the small claims court finds himself in a very difficult position when he is dealing with a case where a litigant is unrepresented. Because judges have assumed, they make the assumption that all counsel want to see everybody treated fairly. So you as counsel, when you're in a case and you're against an unrepresented litigant, a judge doesn't want to see you taking advantage of some legal loophole. That's going to annoy him significantly. Uh, and the, the unrepresented litigant poses some interesting problems. A suggestion that I would make to you in dealing with an unrepresented litigant is at the pretrial conference, when you're talking about issues, get it out on the table and say to the pretrial judge, there are certain facts that I think should be agreed to. And once the unrepresented litigant hears from the pretrial judge, you know, Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so, it's no harm in, if you agree to these facts. It will speed up the process and it would be a good thing to do. Get those issues all out at the pretrial. And if they don't get resolved at the pretrial, bring them up again at the trial and say to the judge right at the beginning, judge, I'm prepared to agree to X, Y, and Z, A, B, and C. And I just can't seem to indicate to my opponent here that for him to do that is not harmful to his case. If you try to make too many technical objections against an unrepresented litigant, you will get the judge against you and you will be fighting an uphill battle. And, and he will undoubtedly give the unrepresented litigant the amendment he or she seeks and you, you'll, you'll, you will only make things difficult for yourself. Judges in the small claims court want cases to be decided on the merits. They want cases to be decided on the evidence. And they want to make sure that each of the litigants brings all of the right evidence. Judge Zucker mentioned this morning the, the inquisitorial concept. And that happens quite a bit. In a case where both litigants are unrepresented, the judge really has to act as judge and counsel for both. He has to make sure that all the right cross-examining is done. He has to make sure that all the right exhibits get filed. And um, I'm sure you've all, you've all seen that at one time or another. One of the, uh, another area, let's assume that your counsel, you're acting for the plaintiff. And to use my garage example again, you get the plaintiff nicely through his examination in chief. The unrepresented defendant asks a few ineffectual questions. And then all of a sudden, the judge takes over. And bang, your case is up in smoke. <laughs> uh, I've seen that happen very many times. And from a strategic point of view, I think a way to avoid that happening is if you narrow the issues as much as possible, it will be hard for the judge to find an excuse to interfere in the case. So again, I urge you to deal with some of these things ahead of time, either at the pretrial 
or before the case actually starts. Sometimes when the judge does this, counsel react. This is a mistake because the judge is only trying to do his job and you will alienate him if you continue to act that way. Keep in mind that he makes the assumption that all counsel want to be fair. On evidentiary matters, <clears throat> I have a slightly different view. Now, I can recall and many times during the course of a case where a legal doctrine such as consideration would come up, Judge Ferguson would stop, she would address the audience, and she would explain what consideration was. She'd give the, everybody sitting in the courtroom a lecture about it. Now, judges can't do that today. A, a time simply does not permit. And I, I know that I've said many times to the people sitting in the courtroom where they were unrepresented by counsel, this case involves a very complicated principle of law and it's very difficult for me as a judge to sort this out if I don't have all the facts. And I do think that judges in the small claims court are very conscious of their obligation to the public because they simply see so many members of the public. Now what do you do about something like the hearsay rule? You've got an unrepresented litigant and you start, he starts giving you hearsay or one of his witnesses starts giving hearsay. I have a little rule of thumb about this. If the hearsay does not go to the heart of the matter, I let him talk and counsel's going to object and I tell him, don't bother, don't bother. But if he starts giving hearsay on something that really goes to the heart of the matter, and I think most judges would follow this, that's when you've got to put a stop to it. And you've got to say, look, witness, uh, you can't tell me that that's hearsay. It goes to a matter that's extremely relevant. And unless you've got the other witness here to say that, I can't listen to that evidence. You as counsel, in preparing your own witnesses, uh, for a trial should always warn them about that. Keep away from hearsay, explain to them what it is. That's part of your preparation of the witness. Uh, this morning Judge Grossberg gave a very good analysis of the pretrial conference. The pretrial conference has become a very significant part of any lawsuit today, no matter what court you're in. And you should use the pretrial conference as a settlement vehicle. The parties are there. They are going to hear something from a judge who's independent and who's going to express his opinion about the case. It's a wonderful time to settle the lawsuit because everyone's attention is so focused. But if you can't settle the lawsuit, if it can't be resolved at that stage, as counsel, you should try to influence what the judge endorses on the document Judge Grossberg told you about, the pretrial report, where all the issues in the case are listed. Because when the small claims court judge arrives at his office in the morning and starts looking at the file, he first goes through the pleadings and any documents that have been filed so that he understands the issues. But the next thing that he reads is the pretrial report where the issues have all been set out or any agreements that have been made on the facts. Particularly in the case of an unrepresented litigant, that's the time for you as counsel to say to the pretrial judge, here's what I think should be agreed to and why, and let the pretrial judge influence the unrepresented litigant. And at the end of the pretrial conference, say to the pretrial judge, Your Honor, would you mind making a note of this so that it appears on the record all the things that were agreed to? And always have the pretrial judge read back to you what he has written down about the issue. 
always get them to read it back to you because I can tell you as certain as night follows day that the judge who hears the case will have seen that and he will be waiting for you to deal with each and every one of those issues. He will be waiting for the evidence on each and every one of those issues. So have him read it back to you so you know what's in there. Or go to the courthouse, look at the file and look what's in there. Because he will be waiting for that. Another thing that should be canvassed at the pretrial conference, and again I, I stress this with an unrepresented litigant, is the admissibility of documents and evidence. Because if your unrepresented litigant has evidence that you think shouldn't go in, now's the time to tell him about it. And let the pretrial judge, let him hear it from the pretrial judge. You know, if you want to prove your case, this is what you've got to have, A, B, and C. And the lawyer's right that the evidence that you've got so far on this issue isn't good enough. Get that out on the table. Because if you don't, and it becomes a problem at the trial, the first thing the judge is going to say to you at the trial, did you canvass this at the pretrial? And if you say no, he's going to say, why not? This should have all been cleared up ahead of time. If you're going to file affidavit evidence, put that on the table at the pretrial conference. Again, make it part of the endorsement. Failing that, if you haven't done that, get an agreement with your opponent. Send them a confirming letter with, you know, outlining all the things that you've agreed to. But you're far better off creating a record at a pretrial conference and having it uh, endorsed by the judge. Keep your cross-examinations short and to the point. Um, it is the exceptional case, in my experience, in the small claims court. But I have only sat as a deputy judge, and I think sometimes, I don't know if I'm right about this, Your Honor, but I do think that the deputies get the easier cases. Uh, I, I feel that way. Um, and I know that some cases in the small claims court can be complicated and do take, uh, require lengthy court time. If you have such a case, you should warn the court in advance and try to get special scheduling. But don't let your cross-examinations go on and on. Keep them to the point and keep to the issues. In the small claims court, I think that one of the most important parts of the case is the closing argument. The judge has really seen uh, a small picture because of the constraints of time. He hasn't seen all the window dressing if counsel have done their job properly. But closing argument is very important. And I can tell you this, that sometimes in closing art, just before the argument starts, I'm thinking one way about a case. And then I hear a very good logical closing argument that ties in the facts and the law and I change my mind. Closing argument is very important. It must be orderly. If you have a number of points to make, give them a number and say, Judge, my first point is such and so. If, you are, if there are some legal principles involved and you are going to tie in the facts with the law, make sure you do it. And if you're going to give the judge any law, 
make sure you've got some cases there. If you're going to refer to cases, make sure he's got a copy too. And have them ready. There's nothing worse when you've got a courtroom full of people that are all waiting for their turn and counsel start fumbling through their files. Be organized. Be prepared. Because the small claims court, the issues in these cases revolve so much around credibility. As a judge, I like assistance from counsel in terms of references in the evidence or the, either the oral evidence or the documents to credibility issues. The most dramatic way and I don't care what court you're in, for any counsel to prove a point is to take a piece of evidence that has been tendered by his opponent and use it against him. If you can take an admission against interest made by one of your opponent's witnesses or documents, it is a very valuable tool. It is very, very persuasive. A statement made by a witness at a time when litigation was not comp contemplated by anyone is a very damning piece of evidence. A document that was written at a time when no lawsuit was ever thought of can be a very valuable piece of evidence. Sometimes in these cases, you've got to do some footwork, and you've got to go out and find these little tidbits of evidence. They're there. <clears throat> Those are things which impress a trier of fact in a credibility case. And of course, the old story, a picture is worth a thousand words. Photographic evidence, don't be afraid to be creative. It, the garage case, the photograph of the sinking garage or the garage door that won't open or close because the garage is settled, a, an invaluable piece of evidence. Sometimes what a lot of judges in the small claims court do is this. Before the closing argument starts, they will say to counsel, well, isn't this the key issue in the case? Now, you may not have thought that was the key issue in the case, but the judge thinks so. So you better have something to say about it. Now, sometimes you might be in the middle of your argument, and the judge will say to you, well, what about this issue? And at that stage, you've got to jettison your whole prepared argument. You've got to deal with that point because it's on his mind. And that can happen in any court that you're in. I tend to think that it happens more in small claims court, particularly with an unrepresented litigant, because a judge will want the represent counsel who's representing the other litigant to focus in on the issue so that the unrepresented litigant doesn't think he's getting steamrolled with a, a lot of uh, window dressing or irrelevant uh, submissions. You should always try to organize your closing argument in advance. And sometimes you can't always do this because the evidence changes. But you should try to at least have some kind of an outline of the submissions you're going to make, the legal principles you're going to rely on, and uh, some method of tying it all together. But be logical, be concise, and be creative when you can. Any of the things that apply in any other court uh, in terms of advocacy apply equally in the small claims court.
you can learn a lot of discipline in the small claims court by confining yourself to be concise because, as I've said, you've only got that judge's attention for a short time. And I find it very hard sometimes. It, you know, one of the greatest qualities a judge has to have is patience. And he has to be able to sit and listen. And sometimes it's very hard. And you as counsel have to try to help him by getting to the point as quickly as you can and as intelligently as you can. Um, I'm going to conclude uh, by uh, just making a point, because I was very surprised at the large number of people in attendance today. I didn't think there would be this many people. My old friend and partner of many years, Jeffrey Lyons, always used to say that when you came to one of these conferences, if you got one little nugget out of the thing, it paid for itself. I'm going to give you the nugget right now. <laughs> the small claims court, the jurisdiction is going up to $6,000. I have always believed that a lawyer who properly organized himself could have a very comfortable career doing small claims court litigation. I have a theory that what has ruined the practice of many litigation lawyers today, and when I say ruined, I mean in the sense that has taken the enjoyment out of their practice, is the fact that corporate litigants insist on being charged on an hourly rate. And of course, once you do that, the cost of litigation goes through the roof. As a lawyer, as a law student, when the jurisdiction of this court was $400, we had a nice practice charging a flat fee for doing work in this court. And uh, nobody seems to do that anymore. In the city of Toronto, if there are five small claims court, courts, and you get five people, and you have coverage every day in every court, charge a flat fee, you can make a very nice living. Um, I enjoyed being with you today. Um, <clears throat> I've enjoyed my experiences, both as a student, as a young lawyer in that court, and now on the other side of the bench. And anyone who at any time ever wants to talk to me or ask me anything, you need only pick up the phone or write me, and you will hear from me. Um, <clears throat> I also must tell you that I may not be able to stay for the question period, but if you have a specific question you want me to deal with and you give it to the chairman or write or call me directly, I will deal with it. Thank you very much. I can assume that uh, Paul's suggestion that you call him would be, of course, without a fee. <laughs> I have the pleasure of introducing Alf Shaw QC uh, as the next speaker. Um, I note in Alf's um, career, it indicates that he's a member of the Scarborough Law Firm of Shaw and Associates. Uh, he's been a general practitioner for more than 43 years. I'm not sure how much more, but for more than 43 years and a deputy small claims court judge for over 16 years. So he certainly has a great deal of experience. Uh, when I, I didn't realize, although I met and I know Alf personally, that uh, I'm not sure whether he has been in Scarborough for 43 years, and uh, that in itself is an accomplishment. <laughs> but I welcome him here today. Thank you. Good morning. 
When I was asked to speak about uh, new trials, I didn't realize when I accepted how difficult it would be. Because unbeknownst to me at the time, uh, there's very little in the way of motions for new trials that appear before me, at least have appeared before me, and I canvassed the, the different uh, small claims courts, and it's relatively unknown, generally speaking, that there is a procedure by which you can get a new trial. I think perhaps the reason that it's not too well known is that it's more or less discouraged by the different courts, and for very good reason. If someone has literally had his kick at the can, or her kick at the can, why should they be given a second chance? Uh, in uh, Judge Zucker's book, he heads one section of the uh, area that deals with appeals and new trials by the statement, is this the end of the road? And that primarily tries to tell the, the person who uh, is the losing litigant whether or not there is any purpose in continuing the litigation. Now, as I pointed out, new trials are not used very often. And the reasons being that most people don't know that it's available, and also that it's not readily obtained. Now, a new trial, as the name implies, is a fresh trial subsequent to one which has already taken place. You've got to have a trial where both parties are present. It's not to be confused with an application for setting aside a default judgment. A default judgment is obtained sometimes when a litigant has failed to appear at a trial date. And subsequently, an application to set aside a default judgment or to restore a matter to the trial list uh, is successful. That only puts the matter back on the list and sets a new trial date. That is not a new trial, and I would like to emphasize that. In order to take, uh, uh, in order to uh, obtain a, uh, a new trial, this is done by way of an application, and the rules uh, of the uh, small claims court will apply. Rule 1804, subsection 1, says that within 30 days after the trial, a party may make a motion to the court for a new trial. On the hearing of the motion, and this is very important, the court may, A, grant a new trial, or B, pronounce the judgment that ought to have been given at trial and order judgment to be entered accordingly, or dismiss the action. Now, as I said at the beginning of my remarks, I have not had in my experience as a small claims court judge, deputy small claims court judge over 16 years, very many motions for new trials. I don't know, maybe my friend Judge Zucker can tell us whether or not the uh, rules brought about the new trials more recently. Is that correct? Well, the, the, the 1984 rules. That's when the that's when the application for a new trial came into being. Okay. Prior to that, and, and consistent with that at this time, which should not be confused again, is an appeal to the divisional court. And uh, Madam Justice Maura Caswell will be talking about that subsequent to my, my lecture. Now, the application for a uh, new trial must be accompanied by an affidavit. And the affidavit should set out the reasons for wanting a new trial. Now, they have to explain with some good reasons, either that, that a very important piece of evidence, a witness couldn't be present, or uh, some uh, invoice or other material was not available at the time of the trial. Now this has to be tested and it can't be frivolous. At a pretrial hearing, I'm sure that the pretrial judge or the party sitting as a pretrial hearer would advise the litigants as to what materials and what evidence they will require 
in order to proceed to trial. So it will not be a good reason just to say I don't, uh, I didn't have a piece of evidence at the hearing or a witness wasn't available. Because if it was pointed out at the pretrial that these things are important, then that party should have made sure that the evidence and the party, the witness was present. And if you fail at a motion to get a new trial and your action is dismissed or whatever, you don't have another chance. But if you're given a chance, it should be made so that the party who has to go again to the trial because you have failed in your first so-called kick of the can, that party should be made to pay some nominal costs. It's not a case of penalizing the party, but it's a case of making sure that there's some equitable balance between a party who has already been successful at a trial now has to go through the rigors of another court trial. And therefore, I have concluded that it should be difficult to obtain a new trial. And for a very good reason, one, it, it increases costs and it prolongs litigation. And there should be some finality to uh, uh, a trial. Now, hearing cases that have come before me, there are times when a litigant doesn't have his act together, so to speak. And it should be pointed out immediately at the trial that there are certain pieces of evidence missing and that he will not succeed and that he should ask for an adjournment, particularly if it's the first time that the matter has appeared before the court. I don't think it's fair for someone to continue to ask for adjournments and then come without his case prepared and then hope to seek another adjournment. Now, the bottom line in all the uh, material today is keeping costs down. Everyone that has spoken before me has mentioned that. And in order to keep costs down, it's not meant that they should not avail themselves of your services, the services of a lawyer or an agent or whatever, because the agents and the lawyers can be very helpful in putting together for an unrepresent for, for a litigant what needs to be done in order to succeed at a at a trial. However, if the litigant is unrepresented, I have taken the, 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 the task of helping that litigant at the trial in order to see that the, the matter is dealt with fairly. Now, if for any reason the uh, trial, uh, the application is not brought within the 30 days, there's the rule 302 subsection one, which permits you to lengthen the time prescribed by the rules on such terms as are just. It's not prudent to allow too much time to elapse before bringing an application for a new trial because that would again delay litigation, the finality of the, of, the, of the matter, and it's not for that purpose that we want to keep the list heavy with many cases. Now, in, way, in a way in which these things come about, the losing party after a trial goes to the uh, clerk of the court and asks, what can be done? I've lost the case, is there anything I can do? And most of the time, they're, they're told if the case is a reportable case, that, that there's an appeal that can lie. But not too frequently, as I pointed out earlier, are they told that the, uh, that the uh, a new trial application is available to them. I think in the future that should be made clearer by the, by the respective court clerks, that that is available to them, even though it may not be in the best interest of the court to encourage people to have a second chance. Uh, I also would like to advise that those people who are representing litigants who are now going to have to face a second trial to strongly object at the motion hearing and ask for costs. And if that is done, then there will be some equitable resolution of the matter. Now, 
I think the philosophy of the small claims court has to change in some way. And it's not just to have new trials that I'm talking about. It's, it's to give everybody an opportunity to complete their case in the best possible way before the matter is final and, uh, and the result cannot be overturned. And fairness should apply to both parties in a, in a uh, small claims court case. And for that reason, encouraging new trials is not the best way to go. But I say that since the rule is there, and since the person has an opportunity to, to avail himself of that, of that procedure, that they should take that uh, opportunity. And it's equally important in those cases where the matter was not reportable. Because many people think that if a case is under $500 and they've lost, that there's, that's the end of it. Because everybody tells them there's no appeal if it's not a reportable case. But under the rule, they could still bring an application for a new trial in the same way as it, if it were reportable. And I think, as uh, it was stated earlier by Judge Zucker, that the, that the uh, unreportable cases will probably go up to $1,000 or $2,000 with the increased jurisdiction. In conclusion, the question of new trials is one that is still up in the air. And by my telling you that it's uh, something that you should uh, entertain might increase the, the volume. Thank you very much. I think as uh, Judge Grossberg alluded to uh, during his uh, comments, uh, at one time the civil division consisted of 12 full-time judges. Now there are seven. One of those 12 judges is our next speaker, uh, Madam Justice Moira Caswell. I'm sure some of you appeared before her when she was a civil division judge. I don't think there's any question that um, Justice Caswell uh, reflected as much as anyone the quality of the bench in the civil division. And although I say this in quotation marks, although she is now in the general division, the fact that the uh, Judge Caswell has consented, uh, not consented, but has willingly uh, given up her time to be here today, uh, given her schedule in central, the Central West region, together with the fact that she has been appointed uh, as the liaison judge of the Ontario Court General Division in the Central West Region to deal with the deputy judges uh, that who are hearing cases in, in Central West is an indication of her continuing interest uh, in this particular court. I've known Judge Caswell since uh, her appointment to the Civil Division in 1982. And again, I think there are few people who have maintained and continue to maintain as much an interest. And I'm sure we'll see this today from her talk. So I'm pleased to introduce Judge Caswell to you today. Thank you, Judge Zucker, for those kind words. Your honors, deputy judges, ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to continue my involvement with the small claims court, and I think it a real tribute to the court and what it represents to the people of this province that there is such a good turnout for this program today. I am especially pleased that some of my own deputy judges from the Central West region are here this morning and I want to tell them it was not a command performance. 
One morning, just after I was appointed to the general division, I got a telephone call from one of my, my colleagues on the uh, former provincial court civil division, his honor, Judge Benjamin Lamb. Moiree said, how are things in the BCC? Ben, the BCC? You know, he said, the big claims court. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, that is where you are when you appeal the de decision of the small claims court trial judge, the big claims court, the general division of the Ontario Court of Justice. <laughs> And it is important to note that the appeals to the Divisional Court are governed by the rules of civil procedure and in particular Rule 61 and not by the simplified rules of the Small Claims Court, which we have been hearing about this morning. I have included as Schedule A to my paper a copy of the relevant part of Rule 61. The appeal will necessarily involve questions of law or questions of mixed fact and law. The appeal procedure is full of technical pitfalls for the unrepresented litigant, whether appellant or respondent. And it is only common sense then that a litigant should consider obtaining legal advice before commencing or responding to an appeal. The rules provide that a litigant can appear in person as in any court of the land up to and including the Supreme Court of Canada. And it's interesting to note the initials are the same, you know, the SCC. If a litigant wishes to be represented, then only a solicitor called to the Bar of Ontario may appear in the divisional court. And this is rule 1501. A corporation shall be represented only by a solicitor, and that's Rule 1501, except with leave of the court. There are a couple of cases that I haven't referred to in my material, and you may wish to, to note them. One is uh, 92417 Canada Limited versus the Bank of Montreal, 1984, 45 uh, Carswell Practice Cases, 149. And the other one is 419212 Ontario Limited versus Astro Chrome Crankshaft Toronto Limited, 1991, three Ontario reports, uh, uh, third at 116. And this is a decision of Master Sandler. Uh, leave may be granted to permit an officer or director to represent a company where a company could not obtain sufficient funds. There are other matters that may be considered where leave would be granted, uh, the internal situation of the corporation and the position of the prospective representative of the corporation, the nature of the action and the issues, and whether it would serious, be seriously unfair to the opposite side to have the case presented or defended by a non-solicitor, and uh, whether the proposed representative could properly carry out the duties of a litigant under the rules. In my opinion, there will be more appeals by unrepresented litigants, if only because of the increased monetary jurisdiction of the court. The facts are these are hard times economically, and lawyers' fees are perceived as an additional and sometimes unnecessary expense. I don't agree with that, but I understand it. The jurisdiction of the Small Claims Court has now been increased, as you know, to $6,000. I hear rumors in the wind it may go to $10,000. A judgment for that amount, plus pre-judgment interest, plus post-judgment interest and costs, could represent a considerable sum. And the company, or the individual who may have written off or not defended an action <coughs> for $1,000 or even $3,000 may feel entirely differently about a debt of $6,000 plus. Now there is no appeal unless the action was for payment of money in excess of $500 excluding costs or for the recovery of personal property exceeding $500 in value. On the plain wording of Section 31 of the Courts of Justice Act, it is my view that an appeal lies in any action for the payment of money in excess of $500, excluding costs, 
even though the judgment at trial may be for less than $500. That is my opinion, and it has not yet been tested. The uh, Chief Justice of the Ontario Court of Justice has designated all judges of the General Division as judges of the Divisional Court to hear appeals from the Small Claims Court. If it was a deputy judge hearing the trial or a judge of the Small Claims Court, formerly of the Provincial Court Civil Division, then the appeal is to a single judge. If it was a judge of the General Division, then it will be three judges who sit and hear the appeal. The judge may dismiss the appeal, in which case, of course, the judgment of the Small Claims Court stands. The judge may order a new trial, or the judge may vary the judgment made in the Small Claims Court and substitute the appropriate decision. There is an automatic stay of proceedings in any judgment for the payment of money on delivery of the notice of appeal until final disposition. But the stay is not automatic if the judgment concerns recovery of personal property. In that case, a motion should be made to the divisional court to stay the proceedings pending an appeal. And there is also an interim proceeding on, for a stay on a motion to the small claims court on a limited basis. And of course, the divisional court may on motion lift any automatic stay and any stay previously ordered. Until September 1, 1990, all proceedings in the divisional court in Ontario were heard in Toronto. We're now into regionalization in the province, and as you know, there are eight judicial regions into which the province is divided. And central west, where I sit, is Brampton and north and, and west a bit. Uh, it is possible, on agreement between the parties, that the appeal could be heard in another region than the region in which the original action was heard. It's my view this, act, this practice should be actively discouraged. Surely it is in the interest and purpose of the rules that the region designated, uh, that is designated as such to, should be dealing with matters arising in that particular region. In Schedule B, I have attached, uh, courtesy of Mrs. Mary Dayton, who is the acting registrar of the Divisional Court in Toronto, a uh, list of names and addresses of all the registrars and the court addresses throughout the province of Ontario, which may be of some assistance to you. The registrars and their staff cannot give legal advice. That goes, of course, for the staff of the Small Claims Court, but you all are aware how very, very helpful they can be and, and are uh, to the litigants, whether lawyers, law students, or uh, unrepresented litigants. This is not to say that at the divisional court there won't be some assistance, but the staff is simply not prepared to deal with the unrepresented litigant. That being said, I understand that in Toronto and in some of the regions, uh, Rule 61 is handed out, a copy of Rule 61, or a summary may be handed out, and in fact, in some case, precedents are given uh, to the unrepresented litigant. This might be useful for the law student as well. I have included in Schedule C to my paper samples of some of the requisite forms. I give these to you with this caveat. These are pro forma only, and you must refer to the rules of civil procedure always, and in particular, forms, the forms that are attached to those rules, forms 61A through 61L. It is absolutely necessary to observe the time limits that are set out in the rules. It is always possible to apply for relief to the divisional courts if a time limit is missed, but the process is lengthened, becomes even more expensive, and it is always quite possible relief will be denied. It will always be necessary to order a copy of the trial judge's reasons for judgment from the court reporter in order to determine whether or not you are going to appeal. That, of course, is at the expense of the litigant. Provided you keep a sharp eye on the timelines that are set out in Rule 61, 
Surely the first step should be to order the reasons. The next step then is to evaluate the judgment to determine whether or not there are grounds for appeal. You know, just because you or your client do not agree with the results of the, the trial judge, the trial, does not always mean that the trial judge is wrong. From the registrars, I, have, I make this appeal to you. The trial judge say that they, or the registrars tell me that they will, they can under the rules and they do turn down appeal books because of the question of legibility. They've got to be legible. They don't have to be typed, but they have to be legible. The factum, I have not included a copy uh, or a precedent for a factum. Rule 6111 and 6112 set out the contents of the appellant's and respondent's factum, and they're surprisingly self-explanatory. Each case depends on its own particular set of facts and the law applicable thereto. But the preparation of the factum is one of the most important parts of the appeal procedure, if only because it provides a convenient reference for the judge hearing the appeal as to the relevant facts and the applicable law. You can be sure that the trial judge will read the factums. Each issue must be set out separately with the facts and the law in support. If you think of a factum as a roadmap for the judge, then you will be not too far off the highway, if I can express it so. So I'll leave the area that I've dealt with in my paper as to the procedure on appeal for you to follow with perhaps my paper in one hand, but the rules are always paramount and must be looked at very carefully. There is a dearth of reported cases on appeals from the Small Claims Court, formerly the Provincial Court Civil Division, and before that, the Division Court. Whether this is because of the wisdom and experience of the judges, or because of the expense and effort involved on the part of the litigant, I will not hazard a guess. I dredged from my own files some of my decisions that were appealed. On some I was upheld, on some I was overturned. But I do not propose to tell you when I am discussing these cases which is which. <laughs> Most of the appeals are disposed of by handwritten endorsement, and some of these, once they're translated, are to be found in the All Canada Weekly Summaries. The Divisional Court at Toronto has record of all the decisions reported, reserved, and handwritten at the hearings. They, these are a matter of public record, and there is now a system in place in the region, uh, regions to record the decisions. I had stated earlier that the appeals involve questions of law or questions of mixed fact and law. The grounds for appeal include uh, issues of excess of jurisdiction or absence of jurisdiction, errors in the application of law and the interpretation of statutes, the absence of findings of fact or findings not supported by the evidence, denial of natural justice, which uh, has been defined by one judge as nothing more than fair play in action, Section 25 of the Courts of Justice Act sets out as follows. The Small Claims Court shall hear and determine in a summary way all questions of law and fact and may make such order as is considered just and agreeable to good conscience. The Divisional Court has concerned itself with what is meant by just and agreeable to good conscience and the predecessor section to that on the basis of equity and good conscience. That was the section authorizing the judge to decide the issues prior to the passage of the, uh, the new sections. The court has held that this section does not permit the small claims court judge to depart from general legal principles. 
and, and you've heard about this today. This is a court of record. This is, uh, and the <coughs> trial judge is bound to respect the law and apply it. In Travel Machine Limited in Maydor, and I've given you all the sites, so I'll just give you the name of the cases. Uh, it was held that a trial judge cannot properly, on the basis of equity and good conscience, ignore statutory law. In the Attorney General of Canada versus Kumani, it was held that the Provincial Court Civil Division does not have an equitable jurisdiction which would permit a decision contrary to law. In Klotz versus Sun Alliance Insurance Company uh, in 1989, the trial judge had interpreted Section B of the standard automobile policy and held that the plaintiff was entitled to payment under the no-fault provisions for a therapy machine. The defendant insurer's doctors had not agreed. In an unreported decision in January 1990, Mr. Justice Reed held that the trial judge's interpretation was wrong at law on the plain wording of the policy. The small claims court is a court of record where matters over $500 can be considered on appeal. The term just and agreeable to good conscience would appear to permit the judge to cure technical or procedural defects even at trial. In Smith versus Callum, the uh, justice said that the predecessor section did not entitle the judge to disregard general principles of law, but may very well be interpreted to clothe the court with jurisdiction to disregard technical defects which would defeat the justice of the claim. It is interesting to note a recent decision which certainly suggests a more flexible approach should be taken by the judge hearing the appeal. And I've attached this case uh, to your uh, material, uh, Snuckins versus Conquest Tours, um, an appeal concerning the trial judge's findings of fact to support negligence and fundamental breach of contract. Mr. Justice Reed stated at page 786, Judge Godfrey's decision would be unappealable if simply just and agreeable to equity and good conscience. That is the traditional basis for the exercise of jurisdiction in his court. In my opinion, his decision sa satisfies a stricter test. He correctly found the facts and correctly applied the law. The question of the admission of hearsay evidence and the extent of reliance of the trial judge on that evidence was dealt with in Central Burner Service Incorporated versus Texaco Canada Incorporated. Now this is one I, I, I was upheld. Mr. Justice Steele upheld the trial judge both as to the admission of the hearsay evidence pursuant to Rule 19, which was discussed earlier, and the weight given to it even though there was little or no other evidence to support the successful plaintiff's case. In O'Connell versus Custom Kitchen and Vanity, uh, Mr. Justice White held that hearsay was admissible, even though the plaintiff in this case had not have complied with Rule 19, in the discretion of the trial judge. Now, here's where tactics may come into it, as Mr. O'Connell has told us. In this case, the defendant did not object to the admission of this evidence until the completion of the evidence. In Regina versus Bennett, uh, Mr. Justice Maloney held that the limitation periods in the Public Authorities Protection Act applies to actions in the small claims court. In Inter-American Transport System and Grand Trunk Railroad, Mr. Justice Craig dealt with the interpretation of the term carrying on business in order to determine the jurisdiction of the court. In Creditel versus Hamilton Builders, Mr. Justice Craig dealt with the application of race judicata, and he found that the trial judge had wrongly applied the principle where there had been no hearing on the merits. In a recent case in November of 1992, Spanco Mechanical and General Contractors, Madam Justice Greer set aside the judgment at trial on the basis that the trial judge had made findings of fact inconsistent with the evidence. That issue, uh, in another case, Arnett Insurance and Jalili and Zahiri, in October of 92, uh, Mr. Justice Smith upheld the trial judge. So that might be interesting cases where you, you think that the great basis of your appeal will be 
that the facts uh, do not support the findings made by the trial judge. The divisional court has also considered the conduct of the trial. Uh, in an earlier case, uh, 1985, the, where a trial judge intervened to manage the trial in the face of unacceptable conduct by a difficult party, the divisional court cautioned against the intervention on such a scale, even in a summary hearing, but found nothing improper. A trial judge, while obliged to assist a party appearing in person who is unfamiliar with court procedure, is not obliged to become that person's advocate. The judge's role in this respect is limited. He must assist, but he must not be unfair to the other party in so doing. And having sat in that court for so many years, I know how difficult that can be. And uh, I know I have frustrated a few law students in my day on that very point. Uh, in a recent decision of Mr. Justice Adams, Bizendot and Arzadu, uh, he said, uh, on appeal, an appellate court will not intervene unless it unmistakably appears from the evidence that the trial judge had not taken proper advantage of having heard and seen the witnesses. I, meaning Mr. Justice Adams, did not have the benefit of seeing the appellants testify. And then in a very recent case, in actually April 30th of uh, this year, Mr. Justice Montgomery said, uh, the appeal is allowed. I am satisfied that the learned judge erred in the conduct of this trial by entering into the arena and intervening too far in the examination of witnesses. He also denied the right of cross-examination. A very recent case that I had hoped to tell you more about involves a decision of Her Honor Judge Pamela Thompson, formerly of the Provincial Court Civil Division, in Holden Day, Wilson versus Ashton. The learned trial judge had ruled that a solicitor's account is one on which a clerk can sign default judgment as a liquidated demand. She also ruled that a ministry directed to the clerks to put solicitor's accounts on the trial list for an assessment of damages was, attempt, was an attempt to overrule a decision of the Ontario Court General Division. The Attorney General has appealed to the Divisional Court, citing the trial judge's errors in law, and that appeal was heard in early April. Mr. Justice White reserved his decision, uh, and it is to be released sometime next week. This decision, of course, will have far-reaching ramifications there are many solicitors who choose to sue on their accounts in the general division as well as in the small claims court instead of taxing their accounts. And the Holden Day case will also be significant in that it involves the question of the effect of an administrative action, namely a ministry notice to solicitors in face of a decision of the Ontario Court General Division. Now, I don't have very much time like left, but I would like to deal further with the Snuckins case. This is a case that provides some wonderful insights into the consideration of an appellate judge sitting on a small claims court appeal. And I've included that case, as I've already told you. It's Schedule D to the paper. The Honorable Mr. Justice Reed, who heard the appeal, attached as a rider the reasons of the trial judge, His Honor Judge Donald Godfrey of the former Provincial Court Civil Division. Now this is very unusual. I don't think I have ever seen uh, that kind of, of reporting and I think it speaks so well of the quality of the just judges who, who did sit in that court. This is almost a textbook case since one can refer instantly to the trial judge's reasons when considering those of the appellate judge. Now this was a, a travel case, and you, you all may be or should be familiar with the seminal decision on which all subsequent travel cases have depended, and that is the Jarvis and Swan Tours case, a decision of uh, Lord Denning. Now this was the first case to award damages for loss of enjoyment on a holiday. Now I'm going to be permitted an aside here. I know that it is no longer politically correct to admire Lord Denning's style of writing judgments. But in my way of thinking, not only is he sound in the law, but his judgments are enjoyable reading, and I don't think that's a bad thing for a judgment. Now, this is the judge who commenced one judgment, not this one. It happened 
on 19th April 1964. It was bluebell time in Kent. Now, don't you just want to know what happened? <laughs> I can't tell you. I don't remember. <laughs> Mr. Jarvis was a young, we're back to Jarvis now. Mr. Jarvis was a young English solicitor who was stressed out by his court appearances. I don't know what he was doing in court. If he was, in court, he, he was a solicitor, but there you are. He wanted to travel to Switzerland to ski on his holidays, and he, his travel agent supplied him with a brochure, and, and the brochure was going to, I think, was going to, there was going to be uh, high tea, at, English high tea at 5 o'clock, and there was going to be yodeling at 6 o'clock, and so he was going to get all the comforts of, of home. At the same time, he was going to be able to ski high in the Alps of, of Switzerland. Well, when he got there, he found no one spoke English, and I guess that was the most disastrous thing, and then no high tea, and and no yodeling. So on his return, he sued and he claimed that, that his holiday was completely ruined and there was a fundamental breach of contract. And Lord Denning agreed with him and awarded the solicitor damages of double the monies that he had paid. Hence the travel cases that are in the small claims court and other courts too. Five additional plaintiffs, including his wife, joined Mr. Snuckins in his complaints about his holiday in the Dominican Republic, booked with a travel agent through Conquest Tours. And there were some 60 other plaintiffs waiting in the wings for this test case to be, to be decided. Now, Judge Godfrey summarized the complaints at page 792 and 793. And he, he says, upon arrival, there was mass confusion in the allocation of rooms due to the fact the staff spoke little English and did not know where all the proper rooms were. The initial rooms had no front door, concrete dust, shutters that were painted open, intermittent or non-existent electricity, no water, unfinished bathrooms, a lack of furniture, and incomplete wiring. Then there was sort of a musical bedrooms played, and they were moved from bedroom to bedroom, and it ended up with two couples sharing one room and the disaster there was one of the couples had a small baby and then there were another two couples who didn't know each other who shared yet another room and the two wives didn't get along and just just a complete disaster then he goes on he says he summarizes all the complaints no availability to public telephones dirty swimming pool no water sports construction noise starting about 6 30 in the morning Inconvenience in carrying valuables. Well, there were no doors, much less locks. And, they, and so they had to carry their valuables down to the beach. And one could go in the water, and the other stayed on the beach and watched the valuables. Like, so on. And, and in addition, there were other complaints. But he also went on. He said there were some good things about the trip. The trip. This is Judge Godfrey. The, they, there had been a, a nice flight down. And, and the, the beach was beautiful, and so was the ocean. And they'd had a night in Panama that seemed to be all right. And, there were free dinners and breakfasts, no complaints about the food, I guess. He found as follows. Conquest's negligence in deciding to send its passengers without properly confirming the state of the hotel was the cause of the injuries to the plaintiffs. And he further found, clearly Conquest in this case failed to provide a holiday as promised in their flyer and as such is liable for breach of contract. Based on the foregoing, the court finds that the defendant conquest is liable to all the plaintiffs. The court further finds that the failure of the defendant to provide the plaintiffs with the basic amenities mentioned, amenities mentioned earlier is a fundamental breach of the contract by the said defendant. Since there is a presumption against the survival of an exclusionary clause in light of a fundamental breach, the onus is on the party relying on the exclusionary clause to rebut the presumption and the defendant conquest has not so rebutted the presumption. Then Judge Con Godfrey went on to assess damages. In so doing, he considered the uh, plaintiff's experiences and expectations. He assessed damages globally. He refused to break down damages as urged by the defendants into individual components, and then to include a sum for inconvenience and loss of enjoyment. Now, when uh, I, I was sitting on the Provincial Court Civil Division, we. We had education conferences, and uh, Mr. Justice Reed was one of our, our favorite participants. He would come. He would tell us what we were doing right and what we were doing wrong. Uh, he betrayed a, a great sensitivity to how and difficult it was for a trial judge in the small claims court, and at the same time, 
uh, he made it clear to us that this was a court of law, a court of equity, and we were expected to, to deal with that too. Uh, and that there was to be no, uh, it wasn't going to let us off the hook, uh, if I put it that way. Uh, I read you his quotation uh, about the stricter test, and uh, then he goes on to say that Judge Godfrey found on the facts and correctly applied the law. I do not think uh, he is suggesting that a trial judge can embark on a frolic of his or her own when he referred to the stricter test, but he may be suggesting that there is a certain latitude to be given to the trial judge in the findings of fact, and uh, that, that I can agree with. Uh, first of all, Justice Reed considered the evidence before the trial judge. Uh, he stated then, Judge Godfrey not only made findings of fact common to the group, he considered the experience of each claimant individually and the effect on each of the existence or absence of various facilities. The appellant then had raised the issue of variation in the various claimants' testimony. They got up and testified and their experiences were all different. And the appellant said that this meant the trial judge erred in failing to make findings of credibility. But Justice Reed said this, there is nothing on the record to suggest that any witness was guilty of deliberate fabrication or even that the issue of credibility arose apart, apart from the possible exaggeration which Judge Godfrey had noted. Like all trial judges, he was obliged to make findings of fact no matter how difficult the task. There was ample evidence to support his findings. The appellant has failed to demonstrate blatant or overriding error. There is no basis for this court's intervention on the credibility ground, or for that matter, in any other respect, concerning the way the judge dealt with the evidence. And then he turned to the law. In my opinion, there was a proper basis for his findings of negligence and fundamental breach. I agree that Conquest should not have relied on the insurances of the hotel staff, who had already showed themselves to be under, unreliable. I agree that the breach was fundamental. The essential component of the vacation trip the plaintiff purchased was habitable living accommodation. That they did not get. Judge Godfrey's findings of the common experience of the travelers make it clear that not only was the accommodation unacceptable, but it spoiled the trip. Conquest not only failed to provide a holiday of the contracted quality, but it failed to provide the sine qua non for one. And with respect to the exculpatory clause in the brochure, he again agreed with Judge Godfrey that this clause was ineffective, even against those who were aware of it. The disclaimer was not intended to prevail against a fundamental breach of contract. Judge Godfrey's assessment of damages was also attacked on the basis of, of it having no uh, perceptible basis. Justice Reed disagreed. He found that damages were assessed on the basis of the fundamental breach of contract as prescribed by Jarvis. All the plaintiffs were entitled to the return of their money and something more for disappointment of individual expectations. Although Judge Godfrey did not deal further with the disclaimer clause, Justice Reed did so vigorously, albeit in obiter. Now, it does take a little digging to find those cases, but they are available. And in my view, these cases are recommended really reading for those who would embark on the perilous waters of an appeal from a decision of a small claims court judge. This concludes my remarks to you, and I thank you for your interest and attention.